So thanks to Sky Life as well for inviting me along here. Let's have a look at our, um, the plan for tonight. I'm gonna to look at some of the definitions that we're going to use tonight around dry needling, exactly what it is, and the various structures that we want to target as part of our therapy. We'll look at the essential concepts that underlie why we do the needling, where we do it, and then explain some of the clinical reasoning that we'll need to show why we need to use the dry needling technique with humans. Then we'll stop just temporarily to take any questions that you may have. And you can type your questions down in the chat box uh, on Zoom as normal. You can either type in Arabic or in English, and my fellow panelists will translate, thank you, the Arabic for me, and we'll answer those questions at half time. Right after that, if there are no more questions, we'll go on to looking at some published evidence, looking at different papers, uh, showing how dry needling has been successful in treating different conditions and different parts of the body. After that, we'll have some time for questions again, so you'll have to some time to think about what you might want to be asking me. No questions are bad questions, just my answers might be bad. All right, so please type away and we'll get those questions sorted out for you. All right then, with no further ado, let's have a look. What do we mean when we're talking about dry needling? Dry needling is the use of single use, uh, fully formed needles, which come blister packed like this, little thin needles, which we put through the skin into the muscle, then manipulate the needle while it's in the muscle to achieve a local twitch response. It's a medical technique, it's different from dry needling. And the main target for using dry needling is going to be the treatment of myofascial pain disorders. Now that can be anything, ranging from a tendonitis to a muscle sprain, to trigger points in the muscle, that whole field of myofascial pain. Is myofascial pain important? Yes, absolutely. Fully 21% of GP visits, that's your family doctor visits, um, or 30% of GP visits will be for myofascial pain, 21% of orthopedic clinic visits, and anything up to 85, 93% of specialist pain visits. So yeah, it's, it's a, an important problem. No matter if you're looking at the tendonitis type problems or the muscle spasm problems, the key element to understanding why we do dry needling is to look at this thing called the myofascial trigger point, sometimes abbreviated as an MTRP, myofascial trigger point. That's the target of the needles. Where we put the needles in is dictated by those things. They are easily described as being highly localized, painful, sensitive spots located in a tight band of muscle in patients with this myofascial pain syndrome. It's kind of the defining feature of the syndrome. We'll look at more of that in a moment. But I want to introduce the last concept for you, the local twinch response. The local twitch response is exactly what you want to generate when you use that needle in the muscle. You put the needle through the skin, into the muscle, manipulate it to cause the local twitch response. That shows you you're being successful. When you get the twitch, it's game on. That's exactly what you want. If we go a little bit further and then have a look at what is this trigger point? There are four basic reasons that physiotherapists might want to look at myofascial trigger points because they change the body. They change the body's range of motion, so each joint that the muscles cross will be limited in its range of motion. Trigger points in the muscle also change the power of the muscle, so you can't generate the strength that you require to move the body parts. And that's true equally of sports people, stroke patients, sedentary workers. Trigger points change range, they change power. Clearly, they produce pain as well, but pain's the least of your worries. For physios, we worry more about power and range of motion and indeed proprioception, that sense of balance that the body has. There are some excellent papers showing how the proprioceptive balance is changed by trigger points as well. So if you look at that, I mean, that's the physiotherapist's daily bread and butter, isn't it? You're treating range changes, power changes, balance problems, and pain. Trigger points are superb targets for physiotherapeutic treatment. 
Now I'm very biased. I love needling. I love it. But you must understand that the mainstay of physiotherapy remains retraining the body's movement patterns. So exercise remains the key exercise modality that we have. All the hands-on things, all we do with the needles is all about getting the patient to be able to move better again. Remember, rehab is establishing normal actors, uh, activities of daily living for the patient. So yes, exercise is important, but some of those patients need a little bit extra. And that's why we use dry needling to create that therapeutic window of opportunity. Some characteristics now of those trigger points, because when we now understand the characteristics, we know what to look for in the patient. If we look at the integrated hypothesis, this is the, perhaps one of the better explanations for why trigger points occur where they do. The hypothesis says that at the neuromuscular end plate, that's where the nerves plug onto the muscle bellies, there is a dysfunction. There's a dysfunction between the nerve impulses to the muscle and how the muscle itself is functioning. Now that can be a presynaptic or postsynaptic or even intrasynaptic problem at the terminal plate there. It results essentially in the nerve and the muscle not communicating properly. Most of it revolves around acetylcholine and the enzymes around that. And the bottom line is that the actin and myosin don't slide past each other the way they should. Because at that molecular chemical level, there is this lack of sliding, the cardinal characteristics appear. And you can see that on the table on the right of the screen there. The tight palpable band lies in the line of the muscles, in the, in the, in the direction of the muscle fibers, and you can palpate it. It feels tight, unlike the adjacent muscle tissue, which doesn't feel so tight. If you run your finger up and down that tight muscle band, you'll find a particular spot, which is extremely painful, extremely tender. And that very tender nodule, that tender spot, is where the nerve plugs onto the muscle, the neuromuscular end plate. And that's where this trigger point occurs. If you push it, the patient will give a characteristic uh, exclamation, oh yes, that's my pain, exactly right. Those are all palpatory findings. But if you go and do uh, a muscle length test or a strength test, you'll find they're also limited there as well. So again, we've got pain and power and range of motion problems. Those are the cardinal characteristics of the trigger points. And you can confirm those by palpation and believe it or not with needling, right? You put a needle into the muscle at the neuromuscular end plate and you make it twitch. Now here's the question, of course, do these myofascial trigger points actually exist? Is there a real target for us to put the needle into? Pain is much more complex than just a muscle spasm, isn't it? We know there are head cognitive issues. We know that there are dietary issues as well. Pain is a complex issue. It's a biopsychosocial phenomenon. Now, in the old days, we used to believe that all pain was in the tissues, and we only had to look at the muscle or the bone or the joint to explain the patient's experience of pain. But that's just not true anymore. The evidence is quite clear. We have to incorporate what happens cognitively and the patient's biosocial experience of pain as well. So how does a tissue-based therapy like dry needling fit into that understanding? Well, it turns out that those trigger points, the targets of dry needling, are best described not as local tissue phenomena, but like Simon of Wolfson's has said, discrete secondary peripheral neurogenic manifestations of central sensitization. So where the nerves plug onto the body, the neuromuscular end plate, that's the target of our dry needling. And if we can show that that target is there scientifically and can be changed by the intervention of dry needling, well, then we're onto a good thing. And that's gonna be the biological underpinnings of the treatment of dry needling. So I propose to look at this in four different ways, okay? four legs of evidence, if you will. We're gonna look at some sonographic evidence, evidence from ultrasound. We're gonna look at some electromyography evidence, evidence from biochemistry, the biochemical changes around the trigger point. And then perhaps somewhat controversially, the palpation evidence. One at a time, those four legs of evidence 
and then we'll break for some questions and see what you guys have got. So don't forget to type your questions down in the question bar and we'll have a look at those in just a moment. Ultrasound, sonography is the first one. Now, uh, Srinivasan Sikdar uh, has published a number of papers in ultra, uh, of ultrasound um, where he's using a particular technique to treat ultrasound characteristics of the tissue around the trigger point. A couple of different ways. He's used some blood flow, he's used some vibration sonar elastography as well, different techniques of ultrasound to show the characteristics. In his 2009 paper, he's characterized those as. Uh, myofascial trigger points as being characteristically evidenced on ultrasound as hyperechoic areas between 0 0.16 centimeters and 1.1 centimeters are so definitely there, can measure them on ultrasound. They look different to the surrounding tissue. They look so different. And there's also blood flow changes around that area. If you have a look at the picture there on your right of the screen, you can see how arterial blood goes in the right and deoxygenated blood down blue, even as you go right through the capillary bed, like any capillary bed will do. Normal blood goes in, normal blood goes out. And that will be the bottom diagram, the bottom diagram where you get typical outflow resistance with systole. So the blood pumps, goes there, the vascular bed expands a bit, retreats back to normal and the blood goes out. But in a muscle with a trigger point, now we're looking at the top picture. At the top of your screen, you can see how with higher outflow resistance, SICDAR showed that not only do you get more peripheral res resistance in the trigger points around the vascular bed, but there's even retrograde deoxygenated blood flowing back up the red artery. Now that's quite astounding, right? It looks like a compartment syndrome. On ultrasound, very definite changes around the neuromuscular end plate, trigger points. That was confirmed in a second paper the next year, 2010, same sort of uh, findings over there. And I'll show you some pictures in a moment um, of the colors that he showed on the ultrasound to show how those um, tr trigger points were very, very different. The literature reviews after then that you can read simply confirm the same idea. But let's look at those pictures first, shall we? Here we have the upper trapezius muscle on ultrasound enhanced with color on the left. You see that? Normal enhanced. Okay. In the upper trapezius, you can see how the trigger point is very different to the surrounding tissue. It's hypoechoic. So the evidence for the existence of a trigger point, the target of dry needling, on ultrasound is quite clear. Let's move on then to look at some EMG or electromyography evidence. 2015, you pointed out in his paper that the electrical signals that you get measuring the potentials around the muscle, the trigger point, characteristically show a shift to type two muscle recruitment, more fast twitch fibers. No surprises there that the trigger points show <laughs> decreased endurance, right? Because they're preferentially using type two fibers. And the quote there from the paper would be that there are electrophysiological quantitative diagnostic features of trigger points that help you with diagnosing the myofascial pain syndrome. Trigger points are distinctive on EMGs. That was found as well in the same uh, way EMG studies uh, Huang et al. in 2015 using a rat model and they showed on rats how the damage to muscles in rats showed similar EMG signatures to the, EM, uh, to the trigger point signatures. So it looks like a damaged muscle at all stages of healing. So EMG shows the changes characteristic of trigger points and you can identify them on EMG and ultrasound as well. How about biochemistry? There's a fascinating study done by a guy called Jay Shah. Now, he looked at the biochemical characteristics, the chemical characteristics in the tissues inside a trigger point, just outside a trigger point, 
And another muscle distal to that. So gastrocnemius in the study was the distal part and trapezius was the experiment part. So he looked at the trapezius and took a dialysis needle and put it just next to the trigger point, measured the chemicals in that area. And we're talking bradykinin here, histamine, interleukin-1,6, pH even. Measure that chemical, leave the needle for five minutes, and then push the needle even further into the trigger point and you make it twitch. What did he find when he was measuring all these things? Fascinating, really, because he measured the difference between active trigger points, latent trigger points, and normals. And this is what he found. Let's look over here, the, the CGRP scale. Up here, the blue one, the blue high line, is the active trigger point. Yellows, down the bottom here, latent, and the red are normals. And you see how characteristically all of these guys measure different chemical levels in that first five minutes when he's resting the needle, not in the trigger point. As soon as he gets the trigger point and causes the local twitch response, CGRP spikes, and then tends to normalize in that recovery phase. That same pattern is repeated here for bradykinins, you can see, normal spike recovery. And if we keep going in those pictures, interleukin-1,6, interleukin-1,8, same pattern. The local twitch response shows recovery afterwards. Characteristic, you can identify active trigger points because they're chemically different. They twitch like mad and the signature changes right after that. So trigger points are then ultrasound, EMG, chemically different to the surrounding tissue. Showing here as well, when you make a twitch, you tend to get recovery. That's the third leg. What about that fourth leg? This is palpation, right? Physios are mostly hands-on kind of people. That's why this coronavirus is destroying our profession quietly. We can't touch patients anymore, can we? It'll change, folks. It'll change. One of the ways for manual therapy to keep going effectively is for this twitch obtaining intramuscular stimulation. And to do that, we have to be really accurate with our needles, okay? So palpation is a key skill that we have to identify. We need to find the tender nodule within a taut band that when pressed gives the patient their known pain. When we've got that, that's where the needle goes in. If you can't palpate it reliably, then you can't really do that successfully as a therapy, yeah? So there are people who say the trigger points don't exist uh, and they base their evidence just on the palpation studies, which are very unreliable because we're so unused to touching our patients in a way that leads to finding these structures that we're no good at it. Here's a question. If you practiced in a helpful, focused way, do you get better at finding the trigger point? And that's essentially what Mora Lecture found in 2016, is they took a, a study where they compared expert palpations to novice palpates, people who didn't have that much experience with palpating, and saw what's the comparison like between experts, and then how do experts compare to beginners? And if you keep practicing as a beginner, do you get any better? And absolutely, there's a training effect on palpation. You can't, you're not very good at it right out the box. So when you start palpating, you're very unreliable. But the more you practice, the better you get at it. So training is important. The palpatory findings, for sure, are helpful if you've trained. So we have those four legs of evidence to rely upon. The target is the trigger point. The trigger point appears to be there scientifically, and the nature changes when you make it twitch. I would hold that the needles are the most effective way of making it twitch. So yeah, it seems reasonable and biologically plausible for us to use that technique to treat patients who have got range problems, power problems, pain problems, and proprioceptor problems in myofascial pain disorders. Okay, so let's look at some neck pain now, cervicalgia. Lots of patients are, are neck pain patients. I mean, I see two or three a day. Can needling help them? Well, two, three, 2015, 
Lynn Gerber published a paper looking at the upper trapezius muscle. God, so much evidence happens on upper trapezius muscle. And they wanted to see, okay, can we show a change with the patient's known pain and their functionality, so range of motion changes. And what Lynn showed there was that there's a, a clinically significant decrease in the VAS score, that's the pain score, and a clinically significant improvement in the range of motion, which is great. Okay, less pain, better movement. Good result there for that paper using upper trapezius in chronic pain patients, not just acute pain, okay, chronic pain patients. A similar result was found in 2018, a horrible surname, Gallego Sandarubias, 2018. They had a look at using dry needling plus manual therapy, again with chronic mechanical neck pain patients, not the cancer patients, those sort of things, okay? Chronic mechanical neck pain patients. And you can see in the graphs on the left that the dry needling plus manual therapy group, that's the blue group, compared to the sham dry needling plus manual therapy group, okay? Now you'd, you'd expect that with a bit of manual therapy, the patients got better. Yeah, they get better, but they get even better if you add dry needling with it. On the top one on the left there, you can see the pain score, pressure pain thresholds, and the neck disability index as we go down there on each of those scales. The dry needling plus manual therapy group outperforms the sham dry needling group. So what they found is that it's effective, wonderful, better neck range of motion, decreased pressure point sensitivity, which is great, okay? So they can put up with more pressure on the area before they feel pain. And the patients themselves, it's really important, it's patient's self-reported outcome measure. The patients themselves said, I feel much better. The neck disability index scores were significantly different. Note that the starting point of NDI was much higher in the needling group than it was in the, uh, the sham group. And still it showed a great difference. So that's a win, hey? Dry needling for neck pain, chronic mechanical neck pain patients, they will have less pain, better range of motion, and they'll feel happier about it. That's a win for physio. So that works for neck, that's great. Moving just a little bit away from the neck, the upper trapezius, like I say, lots of research gets done upper trapezius because it's such a problem muscle. Turo 2015 looked at using that ultrasound elastography to try and quantify the effect that dry needling has on the upper trapezius muscle. And of course, they found a significant improvement. But what they measured here wasn't things like pain and outcome measures. They looked at the stiffness measurement of the muscle on ultrasound. Okay, that's what elastography does. It looks at how stiff the muscle actually looks on ultrasound. And they found a statistically significant improvement in the stiffness level, but they didn't find a pressure point threshold change there. Okay, but we'll take the win for physio, okay? Significantly looser, can we say, on ultrasound. Here's that same sort of colored in image again. So the color enhanced elastography picture. We're gonna, we're gonna go from the top left of your screen down to the bottom right of your screen. Over here, the top left picture, you can see how that trigger point at baseline is evidenced as a darker uh, spot amongst the green normal tissue. The black is the, the trigger point area. The two images beneath that just enhance that picture to say where the abnormal signals are. As we go from left to right, you can see how that abnormal signal, the dark patch becomes smaller and smaller as you get to week eight. So repeated needling in this case, and you can see how the trigger points become smaller. They become less active. They become far less symptomatic for the patients. Not just the patient saying, oh, I feel better, but on an objective, measurable basis. That's an elastography, Turo 2015. I trust that there's many of us that see arthroplasty patients and knee replacement patients. Well, here's a, a paper that might interest you. 
if you're a scientifically minded person, this will interest you as well, because here's a question. How in the world do you blind a patient from a needle? I mean, the patient's gonna feel the needle, right? If you do a good job of needling, the muscle will twitch every time and it's not comfortable. So how are you gonna blind the patient? Well, what some Spaniards did in 2013, Mayoral, they took patients who were due to have knee replacements done. You take the patient before they have the operation, you mark out the trigger points by palpation, and they use things like the quadriceps and the hamstrings and the gastrox. Mark them out while the patient's awake, they can tell you, yes, that's my pain. Then you put them under pre-med so they can't feel anything. And in between going to pre-med and having the surgery, you either group one, do the dry needling of those trigger points, or group two, you don't do the dry needling. Is there any functional outcome difference for these patients? Do they do better? Do they do worse? What's the difference? Knee replacement patients, and there's no way they can know which group they're in because they were unconscious at the time. On the graph here, you can see the diamond-shaped line, both the diamond-shaped indicators, are the needling group. The other two are the sham needling group and the uh, control group. And you can see that the patients who got needled preoperatively by one month require as little analgesia as the other groups required three and six months later. Effectively, that's going to be a two-month saving of analgesia, that's cheaper to do it this way, and your patient outcomes are gonna be much better because they get going quicker, happier, less pain. So that's fantastic to see, right? Because you can't blind people any other way, just knock them out. So that's a win. Less post-op analgesia. Lower trapezius, really underestimated muscle lower trapezius. Another, fascinating paper was published with dry needling of this muscle. Now here what they're trying to do is to see, okay, exactly how accurate do you have to be? That's the question. If you miss the trigger point by let's say 15 millimeters, you still get the same effects. So they went and palpated the trigger points and either needled the trigger point and lower trapezius accurately or not accurately. Turns out that the experiment group, the accurately needled one, does massively better than the non-accurately needled one. Less pain at one week, less pain at one month, but the size of the effect here is fascinating, okay? It's not just that it feels better. The group that were needled accurately by measuring the, the, the pain questionnaire was literally 5.6 effect size times of that of the control group. That's a huge win. That's massively better than just missing the trigger point. See, so yeah, there really is something to it. Those things that you can find on the ultrasound, on the EMG, biochemistry, by palpation, getting it accurately gives you a much bigger success rate than just popping a needle in somewhere. It's important. The shoulder, eh, the shoulder, the shoulder. The shoulder is a difficult thing. It's my favorite thing in the world to work with. I did my master's thesis in the shoulder, but man, it's a difficult muscle, difficult area, should I say, to fix. And indeed, if you look at the studies, some studies support the use of needling, some studies don't. So let's take a negative study first, Perez Pomares, 2017. They looked at the contribution of dry needling plus an individualized exercise program. Okay, so like probably what most of us do is we treat what we see in front of us. So they used a combination of the exercise, manual therapy, tailored for each individual patient, plus needling or without needling. But they didn't show any difference over just tailoring the program. So that's no great. <laughs> Calvo Lobo, a year earlier, tried needling specifically on the infraspinatus, actives and latent trigger points in older patients with, you know, the classical non-specific shoulder pain. And they found, ah, 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 this works. Reduced pain intensity, increased pressure pain threshold. 
So the studies for shoulder are equivocal. In my own master's thesis, I found a very big difference between uh, sham needling and deep dry needling in the muscle. So you know, I'll be in the green group here, okay, because I think it works. But there are contradictory studies. How about the ankle? Lots of ankle patients as well. Salomoreno, Moreno, 2015, had a look at the proprioceptive exercises with the ankle and comparing straightforward ankle program exercise alone to exercises plus needling. Now I'm biased, of course, but dry needling had a greater improvement in function at one month, highly significant result, and a greater reduction in pain at one month as well. So your patient has less pain and better function winner. If they're a sports person, if they're a footballer, how many people are LFC fans out there? You guys keep beating our football teams, okay? But if you're treating the ankles of the football players, needle them, they're back on the pitch quicker. How about chronic low back pain? Yeah, good evidence here as well. Tell us, Garcia. This is one of those cool papers that joins up different parts of physiotherapy. We talked about the brain people and the tissue-based people. This paper represents a coming together of those two because the, the research question here was, if we add the neuroscience education to our patients with low back pain, does it make a difference to them? Okay, so we've got trigger point dry needling with or without the neuroscience education. What's really happening with these patients? Can we make a difference for them? The only thing that changed between these two groups, I mean, they, they measured the Oswestry scale, the Roland Morris questionnaire, pressure points, they measured all these things, but the real difference was this. If the patient presents with kinesophobia, which we know is a cognitive thing, right? If they present with kinesophobia, then trigger point with dry need, sorry, trigger point dry needling with neuroscience education gives you a better reduction than straightforward needling. So it appears if you're taking a biopsychosocial model, the more psycho or cognitive symptoms the patient has, the greater need for you to employ uh, the neuroscience education model. So that's good. Did both groups improve? Absolutely. Both groups experienced similar decreases on all those outcome measures but only the kinesophobia group did better with neuroscience. Okay, so there you go. If you're wondering about how do all those keel start back programs and all that, where do I employ the neuroscience? It's for those guys who show uh, yellow flags or uh, high score on keel. Then TMJ, temporomandibular joint problems. There's lots of research on TMJ at the moment. Gonzalez Perez in 2015 showed that needling the lateral pterygoid, you know, really inside over here, it has to do with the, the discal movement, right? They showed that needling this area, which people panic about because it's really close to the trigeminal nerves, right? It's both safe and effective for the management of myofascial pain. What they did in this paper is they compared uh, the physical dry needling uh, with patients being on, put onto meds like um, methocarbamol and paracetamol. Both groups improved with respect to pain at rest and with chewing, bruxing pain, but the dry needling group improved more so, especially after one month and three months. Here's the cool thing. The effect size of dry needling was double that, double that of medication. I presented these findings to a group of dentists in Palestine last year, um, and they were, they, they were impressed, okay? That like double the effect size of meds. So there's definitely a role for dry needing for physiotherapists, never mind, in the treatment of temporomandibular joint function. And again, another important finding here, what do the patients think about this? Well, patients who were needled said their treatment was optimal 43% of the time versus Patients who got medication only, only 13% of them said their treatment was optimal. So the patients love it, and it's more effective on an objective basis. Hmm. 
Here's a newer paper, Ganadi, 2020. This is a fascinating because they're looking at stroke patients, okay, stroke patients, where you think that the cognitive part of the equation is, is mixed up. Even though stroke is essentially a central nervous system problem, does it show improvement if you do tissue-based therapy? I've broken the paper down into some, out, uh, into some measurements that they reported here, and I've tried to show uh, a little bit of um, insight into the paper as we go. So I'm gonna take you through each of these one by one. The column on the left are the outcomes that they measured, and I'll make comments about the dry needling group and the placebo group as we go through. So on the modified Ashworth scale, the dry needling group showed a 0.75 uh, point difference, a change in the right direction, where the placebo group showed no change. That's a change, but is it important? Is it clinically significant? Yeah, because the MCID, the minimally clinically important difference, is 0.73 for the lower limb. So, yep, that's a clinically significant change. Your Ashworth scale gets better when you needle stroke patients. How about some functional measurements like a timed up and go test, the TUAG, timed up and go? The dry needling group got hmm, nearly nine seconds faster for the timed up and go test. Whereas the placebo group didn't even get one second difference. Is that an important difference? Yeah, the MCID, the minimally clinically important difference here is 3.4 seconds. Okay, so needling group is three times that. So that's a winner. We can needle stroke patients. Single leg stand showed no difference, but it's a notoriously unreliable test anyways. No use in doing it for a study. How about the 10 meter walk? Never mind how fast you do it, okay? So they got much faster than in the needling group, nearly seven seconds faster, but the placebo group was only nearly two seconds faster. MCID there is 0 0.1 meters per second. So you can see the improvement in the needling group is massively more than just the placebo group, but, which is good, okay? It, it, it's good that the placebo group improved because you would think that normal physio should actually work, and it does, but you get more bang for your buck from the needling. Active range of motion, no change in that. That's no surprise because it's a cognitive problem. Eh, so it's a central nervous system problem. So no surprises there. Passive range of motion, they're measuring the ankle, of course, here. You know, you've got to have like a seven degree change on a goniometer to, to see real change here. So it's, it's no great surprise that there weren't positive results there the, because the, the test is not really sensitive with a goniometer around the ankle. But the Bartel index change, look at that, a 10 point change for dry needling versus no change in placebo group. And you only need a three point change on Bartel to be clinically significant. So that's a bit of a winner. There were two measurements of ultrasound as well, which didn't end up being that, that important in the study. You know, ultrasound um, changing muscle dimensions and is, is tricky. It depends on the temperature. It depends on the activation of the body. It, it's, a, it's not a reliable thing to measure. We can see it works for uh, the structure uh, of the trigger point, um, and we can see tears and things like that, but penation and thickness change at the drop of a hat. So those weren't great things to measure, and you can see there's no meaningful change in the direction there. But isn't that a great study, hey? Needling stroke survivors, lower limb, they get massively better on ADL, on speed, it's great. So we've seen that dry needling is biologically plausible um, because we can see scientific evidence for the trigger points and they're the target of, it, of, of the needling. We've seen it works for the neck, the shoulder, the back, the knee, the ankle. There's another paper by Hasse, which I haven't covered tonight, about hamstrings in football players. It works, it works. The question is, okay, is it safe? Uh, we're gonna put needles in people, how safe is that? 2011, McCutcheon and Yellen published a paper on exactly this, causing pneumothoraxes from needling therapies. And their conclusion is, 
our recent physical therapy reviews, right, is that both acupuncture and dry needling administered in the thoracic region, that's the region they're talking about, if it's done by well-trained physiotherapists and other health practitioners, it is, quote, very safe. If you're properly trained, do anatomy, do your propation, get the right technique, then you're safe in doing this. The studies that have been shown uh, for the TMJ, the, the, the knee studies, like the, the adverse events on these studies is negligible. If you do it properly, it's a safe technique. Of course, there are incidents of, of things going wrong, um, but they're anatomical failures for the most part. Okay? But the published evidence is that it's a really safe technique to do. It's efficacious, you saw that in the studies before, based upon a, um, a biologically plausible model. So we've seen all those things. It's safe, it's effective, and it's got good scientific basis. And I think that's what I want to share with you folk tonight. Um, if you want to come back to me with that, with any, any questions, we can entertain some more questions now and see if we can answer those. Thanks for your attention, guys. Doc Rodman. Thank you so much for uh, this interesting lecture. Uh, you still, uh, you didn't manage the Q&A, so uh, you need me to help. Yeah, pl please. Yeah, I'm, I'm still trying to open that thing now. So we'll get it done. Okay. So from the chat box. What is the influence regarding depths of each level of fascia? Yeah, I'm going to not comment about uh, fascia with needling. Uh, the evidence base is not great for fascia in general. Um, and particularly for fascial needling, it's, it's not strong at the moment. There are some uh, studies that have been done in France uh, which are interesting to look at, but um, yeah, in, in, in a lecture about the, the evidence base for dry needling, I'm not going to discuss fascia. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, Muhammad Hassan, can we make lecture focusing on practical point of view? Um, yeah, I'm, so, I'm certain we can do a, a practical demonstration. Um, this evening's lecture is not going to be practical in nature. This one is to do um, more with the background theory. Um, but if, uh, if there are people who want us to do a practical demonstration video, certainly we can do that for you. We also have an application, an app that you can purchase for your cell phone, um, which has a number of demonstration videos on it. And so I can send you the link for that as well. But if you'd like us to do a separate lecture on practical demonstrations, I'm sure we can make a plan with that. Okay, thank you, Bruce. Uh, the second question from uh, Muhammad. Uh, uh, how can I identify main trigger point or mother if there is many trigger? Uh, here's a question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Where to start? Hey? Some patients are so full of trigger points. Yeah. Um, this goes to clinical reasoning, which is a really important question. Part of the, the success of your therapy is going to be taking an accurate and complete history. So once you've got a decent history from the patient and they will, they will explain to you that they have pain when doing a certain activity. Uh, if you break the activity down into uh, how the body parts move, that's very helpful. They might have triggers in the back, the buttock, the leg, the calf. But when you start asking them, ah, it's when the, let's say the quadriceps is working in an eccentric fashion. So the first thing to do is to question them and take a decent history. And the key element that I want to look at in my history is where is the patient showing weakness? Where does the muscle not appear to have enough strength to do the job it's meant to do? So once you've identified the weak parts of the body, I would start with treating those weak parts first with a combination of exercise and needling. Yeah, look for the weakness. That'll be my, my big clue. Yeah, does that help? Find the weakness first and start yeah. there. Okay, so the question, doctor, how to fill the gap between clinical evidence and research evidence in dry needle? Yeah, I think just keep reading the literature. In a moment, we're going to be looking at a number of different papers, okay. um, and that gap is closing all the time. Yeah, that's coming. And, and this again, can you repeat the graph? I think uh, the last graph of... Uh, um, um, I, I think biochemical, 
This is the graph. Will you uh, show the graph. Yeah, there, so there's two. Can you repeat the graph? Yeah. Okay, so that that's the one on the CGRP. And all of the, the chemicals that they tracked on the pH as well show a similar pattern where they spike at the when they make the, when the doc, when the when the researcher made the muscle twitch, everything spikes and tends back to normal. Um, the pH, of course, will work backwards. It's a lower pH uh, and more acidic before the trigger and then more um, normal after the trigger twitches. So it's a similar pattern, whether you're looking at CGRP or bradykinin, or the next day is going to be uh, the interleukins, the inflammation markers. Now, um, whoever asked that question, I'm happy to send you the papers if you want. And they're actually, there are a couple of, uh, of open source papers. As well. um, yeah, open source papers for you to get online, but I'm happy to send those to you for your own reading. They're, they're fascinating. They really are. So just, yeah, just either uh, pop me an email and I can send you the link to that paper. Okay, is, is dry needling the first choice for fibromyalgia? No, no. <laughs> fibromyalgia is a, is a disease uh, which is characterized by uh, significant cognitive problems, significant nutritional problems, lack of sleep. Uh, there, are, there are some really important things that you've got to fix before you look at the muscle pains that are involved with fibromyalgia. Fibromyalgia is actually a separate clinical entity to myofascial pain. The difficult thing is they often overlap, but the drivers for fibromyalgia as a clinical entity are things like um, uh, their nutrition status, their exercise status, even sometimes the hemodynamic status that, that drives that. They might also have myofascial trigger points but that's not the cardinal driving feature of fibromyalgia. The sleeplessness is a problem for fibro. So that's, it's different. It's not, not my first line. For fibro patients, I want to fix their nutrition and their cardiovascular status first. And then we'll sort out their, their trigger points if they've got them later. Okay. Uh, I have a lot of questions. So if, um, if you we'll take them at the end. select some questions uh, to answer and some to... Uh postpone to the last of the lecture no problem okay so i think if we have if we haven't got any questions that relates to the first part of the lecture just for clarity then okay. we'll go on with the rest so, of the presentation for, for, and take them for, at the end for what eccleston does dry needle point matching that of the acupuncture sure okay so um there have been some estimates and some pa published papers anything between 70, 71% and 90%. But you've got to remember that the correlation does not equal causation. And in this case, the correlation is actually spurious. There are so many acupuncture points that cover the whole body that it's, it's surprising that it's only 70%. Uh, the acupuncture points are classically on the surface of the body Myofascial trigger points happen inside the body, inside the muscles. The correlation is spurious. The, you know, it, it's, it's just, it's a spurious correlation. Um, even though there are quoted figures, they're philosophically different, they're practically different. There's just, yeah, the correlation is spurious. That's the best thing I can say there. Okay, uh, this is the last two questions and I, I post yeah. all the questions later. Is there more sure. than one concept regarding needling therapy? I have been taught that we needle the weakest muscle after manual muscle testing. Yeah, so my, my own practice would be certainly that the myofascial trigger point itself creates um, the apparent or the appearance of muscle weakness. Because the trigger point compromises the way the muscle fibers slide past each other, muscles with trigger points test weaker, even though they're not actually weaker. So I would start with the weakest muscle and I would start with strengthening exercises. Sometimes the patient needs another modality to help them and then needling is entirely appropriate. So my, my gut feel is start with that. I think it's a mistake to start with the tight muscles. And w when we do the course, I'll explain to you why, why I think starting with the tight muscles is a, is a clinical error. I'm, I agree with the person who wants to start with the weak things. Get stronger. This is a question uh, 
So in the organization of the session, what do you, what do you use tri needle if you have six session at the beginning or at the last? So if yeah, okay, yeah. Hmm. So my my typical practice is that I will see a patient on the first session. Um, I'll see them for about an hour and I'll take a good history for them in the first session. Based upon the history, we may or may not want to be doing needling and I have no problem with needling in the first session, but the patient must be on an exercise program, a strengthening loading exercise program, um, preferably before I needle. I mean, if they're sports and they're doing it anyway, we'll needle in the first session, no problem. I'll needle them in the first session, I'll needle them two or three, sorry, three or four days later, a week after that. And that's pretty much all they need between three and four sessions of needling. By the fourth session of needling, you've got all the improvement you're going to get from needling anyway. So there's no point to going beyond four sessions of needling. You may need to see them for longer in terms of their exercise program but three to four sessions of needling and that's as good as it's going to get with the needling addition. Okay. Uh, our college from the board of trustees, Dr. Mm -hmm. Rahim Zuhairi, he thank you very much about this picture. And Thanks, Doc. I ask you please uh, the procedures for post stroke in the mentioned research. Post-stroke Okay, so post-stroke or dementia? I didn't get it. Was just just post-stroke or dementia? The the procedures, yeah, for post-stroke patient. In the yep. research, you mention it in your presentation. The efficacy of the. Oh, okay, right, yeah, yeah. Okay, I got it. Yeah. So yeah. it's so that they were treated as if they were normal musculoskeletal patients. There wasn't a particularly special technique for a stroke patient, for a cerebral palsy patient. Um, you needle that the same way that you would needle any other patient uh, in a technical sense. There are one or two little extra things you need to do in terms of consent. So the patient has to be cognitively okay enough to give written informed consent. But the technical parts of where to put the needle in, the safety aspects, they're all the same. Okay. All the same. So someone asking about the link for practical needling. So okay. Yeah. Okay. You can send. So that's, that's Mohammed. Uh, yeah, that's cool. Them. Okay. Yeah. That. Okay. I've got them now. So uh, Mohammed Fatah is going to ask that. Okay. Can a trigger point be activated again and cause pain, or is it over? Yeah. So, hmm. Trigger points can certainly reactivate once you've you've reset them. If you don't address the underlying strength problems, they can certainly recur. Um, so that's not gone once forever. That's why you need to keep exercising to keep staying strong. The other things that help you with uh, not having trigger points going on are going to be nutrition um, and mental health well-being. So got to have a good attention to nutrition as well. Abdurrahman asks, how much time should we insert the needle according to biochemistry evidence? Well, what the biochemistry shows, it's not the time that's important. It's getting the local twitch response that's important. Now, we're not sure what the optimal dose is. Some people get one twitch and leave. Some will needle until it stops twitching and then leave. That's a bit of an open question at the moment. We don't know how much twitching we need to do. So there's an opportunity for research there. But the answer to your question is it's not time. It's the, the local twitch response and make that go away. That's the best answer. It's not a time, it's a twitch thing. Uh, trigger point isn't up here in a taut band. Hmm, yeah. So it's very unlikely to present as a soft band because what's happening like mechanically is that the, the actin and myosin stay engaged at, a, at a, a fibril level. So when they stay engaged, they feel hard. And that's what they show on the ultrasound is that they're little nodules that are hard. And you can imagine if they don't slide, they're pulled together at the neuromuscular end plate. On the left and right, those bands will be 
appear to be under tension, so they feel tight. They don't feel, they don't feel soft. If your bands are feeling soft, something else is going on. That's not a trigger point. Is the trigger point? Uh, Muhammad asks if the trigger, hello, he's gone. If, if the trigger in same muscle like trapezius, yeah, the trigger points are the same the whole way through the body. If they're in a muscle, um, they feel the same and they give you their pain, the range and the power changes. Um, they're all, the, the trigger point is a trigger point. It's, it's the underlying muscle is similar. So in yes, fact, all, ma all mammals work this way. Okay, even your dogs and horses do. So Bruce, uh, regarding yeah. the question of the uh, upper trap, uh, if, if you yeah. have a trigger uh, in the uh, right and left trap, um, and uh, do you recommend it to have a dry needling for both sides at the same time? Okay, so there's, there's two questions going on there. One, would I therapeutically look at both sides? That's a yes. Would you strength train both sides? That's a yes. Would you needle them both on the same day? That's probably no. And I'll tell you why. If you do a good job of needling, okay, the patient doesn't like you very much. It's not comfortable for between a day, day and a half, up to three days. If you do a good job on both sides, they really hate you. Okay, now it's, a, it's a particularly important with the lower limbs because they can hardly walk properly. I would tend to do fewer needles and try and do one region at a time just for patient comfort and safety reasons. But definitely you need to look therapeutically, exercise-wise, at both sides of the body as well as below and above the affected area. Um, we've got an anonymous attendee who asks, can we use dry needling with stroke for proprioception? I haven't seen um, a paper about that, but my feeling is probably yes, because the proprioceptive changes are apparent with normal trigger points. There's no reason to think that there won't be difference with stroke patients as well, except that stroke patients might have sensory problems as well. So I would say yes, give it a bash, but I can't give you a paper to defend my position. Uh, how much, hello, how much, hang on, we've got to, yeah. How much time should we insert the needle according to biochemistry? Yeah, again, that's not the time, it's the twitch we've got to look at. Can we use dry needling with Bell's palsy? No, Bell's palsy is a neural effect. It's a, it's a, it's a viral infection for the most part. In fact, of, of all the Bell's patients, patients I've seen, only one has been a trauma patient too. One was trauma, one was cancer. For all the others, yeah, they're gonna be a, a viral infection. It's gonna be principally down to neural regeneration, not myofascial techniques. So I, I, I just don't needle my Bell's patients, patients, Bell's palsy patients. I don't find that they have trigger points and I don't see the biological plausibility of it working. So um, sadly, Raga, I wouldn't needle them, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, can I have the paper? Yeah, so Mustafa, you've asked me to send you the paper about dry needling of stroke survivors. Perfectly happy to do that. So what I'm gonna do on this here, I'm gonna give you my email address. And if you send me your email address, I will send you the paper and that goes for anybody. If I mentioned the paper tonight that you want to have a read of, just send me that on that email and I'm happy to share information. Besho asks, uh, precautions for dry needling in a diabetic patient? Okay, diabetes is a great question, great question. Diabetes is one of those problems that underlies a lot, a lot of musculoskeletal medicine because the vascular beds are affected, because the, because the red blood cells are affected, the sensory system is affected, diabetes is a problem. The problem for dry needling is that it's a causative problem, okay? You can needle your patients as much as you like, but if you haven't got their sugars under control, they're gonna recur. That can be a diabetic patient, type one or type two, or even just people who are insulin resistant. All right, so make sure in your history, you get a good handle on your patient's diet and what their sugar levels are like. Then, 
is there a problem with actually needling them? No. Just be careful that you don't inflame a hypo if they're not well controlled, but otherwise it's not a problem to needle them. But be aware that diabetes underlies a lot of musculoskeletal medicine. Um, right. Ha, Raga asks, how do I know I needle the muscle well? There, it's the twitch. It's the famous twitch response. If you get the twitch, it's like a party in the muscle. You definitely want those. Roll of dry needle in the field. Yes. Mada. So it's Maha. Fantastic question. Uh, let me make it broader. Is there a role for physiotherapy in gynecology? Yeah. Women's health and men's health equally. It's a huge field. Uh, we have an entire course that we teach the dry needling of the pelvic floor. Um, for sure. It's the easy answer is yes, come do the course. <laughs> okay. If anybody's wondering, we are desperately short of women's health physios all over the world. It's a great field to get into. Ibrahim asks, how many times or frequency do we do the trigger points in different body parts? What are the signs that could give us good information and feedback about the actual enhancement of the case? So Ibrahim, what I take here is how many times, and I think I've answered that, between three and four times is what you need, must be doing loading and strengthening exercises. And what about the feedback? Twitches. You will see patients improving in their power, their range, their motion, and their ADL. And the best way to see those things is to pick an appropriate outcome measure. And make sure you do that at the front of your case, right? So right up front, you can use any one of those things. So you could use a neck disability index. You can use an oswestry, the, the course scale for the knees. Get them done right up front. And at the end of, the, of your treatment, outcome scales are the best way to see actual improvements, actual enhancements. Raga asked a question about how many needles can I use in a patient? <laughs> Lady off my own heart. All right, so how many needles? Hmm. How good is your clinical reasoning? That's another way to phrase the question. I very rarely need to use more than three to five needles in one session, okay? Because you pick the place you're gonna work at. Most things you can work with exercise, bit of hand work, but those two or three stubborn trigger points might need to get needled. So between three and five, it's like you don't need 20. Yeah, between three and five will be my best answer there. Histological fibers. Yeah, absolutely. So be sure, have a look at that. Uh, at the papers by uh, Jay Shah. They'll have a look at the biochemical milieu and how those change in the effect uh, in, in the muscle that's being needled as well as in the muscles that are distal to that area. So be sure, give me a shout. I'll send you on email Jay Shah's papers. That's it's a, it's an involved question, so it's best to read that one. Dr. Muhammad asks, is there a difference between acupuncture and dry needling? Absolutely. Dry needling comes out of the uh, oriental schools of medicine, whether that's Taiwanese, Korean, Japanese, Chinese, they all have their own fields. The clinical reasoning is important here. If you're looking at traditional Chinese or Eastern medicine models, they don't use medical models at all, okay? So why you put a needle in where you put it will be very different to why somebody who's medically trained will put it in. Okay, so they don't use trigger points. They use meridians and those sort of things. So they differ on a philosophical or diagnostic basis. The actual needle, I mean, heck, you can use a piece of sharpened bamboo if you wanted to, if it was clean and infected. <laughs> but it differs on a philosophical and diagnostic level. Then technically, even though the needle is the same, what you do with the needle will be different. So with an sort of acupuncture technique, you would insert and rotate the needle, stimulate the needle in various ways. But with dry needling, we go in, we make the muscle twitch, okay, which is not common in acupuncture. So yeah, they're, they're different diagnostically and they're different therapeutically. What's the role of nutrition in trigger point treatment? Osama, when I get to Cairo, you and I are gonna have dinner. Nutrition is 
90% of health, okay? If your patient's not eating a sensible diet, they're going to have musculoskeletal problems. Nutrition is absolutely massive. Um, yeah, <laughs> what's the role? It's almost everything. Eat right, exercise right, think right, drink right. You have a righteous lifestyle. Naila, any contraindications to dry needling? Yep, certainly. Uh, there are some contraindications, the chief one of which is the lack of informed, written informed consent. That's important, right? So you've got to have consent. You can't needle people who have had previous pneumothoraces. You can't needle people who are physically unstable or medically unstable at the same time. You certainly can't needle if you are not legally trained to needle either. So yeah, there's some contraindications um, and different anatomical areas will respond differently as well. Uh, Dr. Besho, I see you sent me your email. They just remind me which exact article you want me to send you. And then from anonymous, we have one. If a patient has phobia of my needle, is this, yep, is this effect? I don't, okay, so if the patient is phobic, in other words, is, is like properly phobic, not just nervous, but uh, has a psychological fear of needles, they do exist, that'll be a contraindication to needling, okay? Um, it wouldn't undo the needling effect at all. Uh, we just wouldn't needle them because you would actually make them worse because of the phobia. So it, it's a bit of a funny question. It's contraindicated, therefore you can't say what effect it's gonna have. Although if you needled somebody who was unconscious, the effects on range and power would be the same as if they were conscious. That's my gut feel, but because it's contraindication, I wouldn't do it.